Thomas Made Milwaukee Famous presents The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. <laughs> Good evening, this is Ronald Coleman. And Benita Coleman. Inviting you to join us again on the campus of Ivy College as the guests of our sponsors, the Brewers of Schlitz Beer. The taste of Schlitz. The taste so many people prefer has made Schlitz Beer first in sales in the USA. If you like good beer, do as millions of people are doing all over the nation. Ask for Schlitz. The most popular beer in history. And now, the Halls of Ivy. Welcome again to Ivy. Ivy College, that is, in the town of Ivy, USA. On almost any campus, Saturday morning is an occasion for late rising, eager preparations for various forms of violent relaxation, and assorted escapes from academic confinement. Dr. William Todd Hunter Hall, president of Ivy, also appreciates the boundless promise of the day. But even more, he appreciates his beautiful wife, Victoria, to whom he's saying, A fine Victorian hand has been at work this morning, my sweet. What is it? I have just been in my study. Prepared to straighten out innumerable small confusions, and I find that everything is dreadfully in order. I shall be weeks recovering that chaos, which I always hope gives visitors a proper impression of midnight oil squandered and toil unremitting. <laughs> Was I wrong to do it? It looked as though the wires had broken on a bale of waste paper. <laughs> yes, I know. I... It, it must be rather frustrating for a conscientious homebody to, to have a husband who conducts his official affairs with the happy abandon of a mouse in a wastebasket. Mm. <laughs> what does that make me, a mouse wife? <laughs> a mouse wife, very charming. Very charming. <laughs> but, uh, but would you prefer to have a husband with a neat study and a disorderly mind, or one with an orderly mind? And a study which looks as though it was swept out each evening by an ill-tempered man on a bulldozer. Well, I'll settle for the neat fella with the ill-tempered mouse. Now, uh, shall I go back in and nasty up the tidiness? Oh, no, no, dear. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, uh, may I ask what brought on this outburst of domestic order? It's Saturday. Oh, it's Saturday. Oh. Is that an explanation or just a flat, irrelevant statement? <laughs> Why, it's very logical. Saturdays, I sort the laundry. Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> laundry. Mm-hmm. Now, let me see. Mental association. Clean sheets. Sheets of paper. Ergo, clean study. Of course, darling, the logic is inescapable. Uh, that's your logic, not mine. Well, what's yours, starting with this is Saturday? Well, very well. Now, this is Saturday. Saturday, I sort the laundry. And Mr. Jessup, who delivers the laundry, always reminds me of the little man we asked to take our picture on London Bridge. London Bridge. <laughs> no, please proceed. I am fascinated by your mental processes. Well, it follows quite naturally. I was reminded of that picture, and all of a sudden, I wanted to look at it again. And I knew you had it someplace in your study, so I went to look for it. And I bumped into your chessboard, and I knocked off some of the pieces. And I felt so guilty... I thought I'd make up for it by straightening out your study, you see? <laughs> yes. Yes, of course. A simple chain of events easily followed by anyone. Particularly the seventh son of a seventh son, born with a call, proficient with a Ouija board, and gifted with second sight. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, I do thank you. As Ben Franklin said in his Poor Richard, if you want a neat wife, choose her on a Saturday. Oh. <laughs> You may have chosen me on a Saturday, dear, but you proposed on a Wednesday. Well, the sight of you having always made me deliriously weak in the middle, it was only logical that I should take such a delirious step in the middle of the week. (laughs) And now, a brief farewell, my love. Farewell? Are you running away and joining the gypsies just because your studies neat? No, no, no. I have some matters to clear up at the administration office. Oh. If Mr. Wellman calls, tell him I have left for Upper Rhodesia with my butterfly net. (laughs) Uh, 
to look for the rare Flitterensis Peculiarina. Oh, are you expecting Mr. Wellman to call? No, but that's when he always does call. He is a living inadvertent, alert for the unpropitious. Mm. And I'll tell him you said so, if I can remember it, which I doubt. Now, come on, I'll go to the door with you and pick up the mail, huh? Ah, what a crisp, lovely day. <sighs> you sure you don't want to change your mind and stay home, Toddy? That new two-volume Thomas Jefferson you ordered came yesterday. Oh, no, no, don't tempt me, my sweet. Mm -hmm. Ah, look at them, Vicky. The Harriers of the cross-country team. Uh, nothing more graceful than a foot-runner who has hit his stride. Uh, well, they must like what they're doing. I can't imagine any other reason for running down the street near undies in the middle of winter. <laughs> You know, they look like fugitives from a press while you wait shop. <laughs> Coach Simmons seems to think we have a good chance against Bradford next month, thanks to Bruce Dillon. Dillon? Oh, isn't he the long-distance man? Uh, just distance, darling. Oh. <laughs> long distance is usually a woman. Oh. <laughs> well, at any rate, Bruce Dillon is the best two-miler Ivy's ever had. Oh, look at that poor little perisher. They've left him way behind. No, dear, the others moved ahead. <laughs> that, that's Wally Lovett. Oh, yeah, I know him. Don't they call him Tag Along? Yes, but he makes up in eagerness and perseverance what he lacks in ability. <laughs> uh, hello there, Wally. Oh. Morning, Dr. Hall. Hello, Mrs. Hall. Well, uh, we didn't mean you to stop, Wally. Aren't you being timed or something? Five minutes won't make much difference one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> they don't use a stopwatch on me. Just an hourglass full of wet sand. <laughs> Haven't got my, my strides yet. And, and my, my breath's a little short. Oh, it'll get better when you catch your second wind, Wally. That's what the coach is always telling me. But I'm still working on my first wind. <laughs> Does that sound right to you? It sounds as though your fan belt's broken. <laughs> How can you tell when it's your first or second wind? I, I wouldn't know. I never had a second wind. <laughs> but they tell in your arm, your arms and legs, and you don't know you're breathing, and you don't feel anything, and don't care, then you've got your second wind. <laughs> or else you're dead. <laughs> Molly, tell me, if running is as painful for you as it sounds, why do you do it? I like it. No further questions. Of course, I'd like it a whole lot better if I could come in someplace before last, just once. <laughs> well, if determination and faithful practice have anything to do with it, I'm sure you'll have your reward, Wally. Well, it's a cinch I'm not going to get any better just talking about it. Besides, I guess I've given the other fellows enough of a head start. Joke. <laughs> and away I go. Bye. Bye. Uh, oh, no, no, he reminds me of a rag dolly. He doesn't run, he just slaps. <laughs> Is he really going to try and catch up with the other boys? Try, yes, but he won't, and he knows he won't. But that isn't what's most important to him right now. He's still looking for his second win. And when he's found that, Vicky, he's won his first prize. <laughs> Vicky, you home? Hello, darling. Have a good morning. Wonderful. And worked up a tremendous appetite. What do we have for lunch? Mr. Wellman, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh. How are we having him? Sautéed or scalloped? <laughs> well, he was scorched when he arrived, and by now I think he's burned to a crisp. <laughs> he brought the track coach with him, and... He... I'm waiting, Dr. Hall. In fact, I've been waiting. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wellman. I mention the fact that Coach Simmons has been waiting also. Two. Uh, hello, Mr. Simmons. How are you, Dr. Hall? Oh, I'm fine. I'm sick. <laughs> sick of de-emphasis. It's all you hear. De-emphasis here, de-emphasis there. What's the matter with emphasis? I think, Mr. Wellman, that perhaps you I... You told I... me what you think, Simmons, that Dr. Hall has told everybody what he thinks, and nobody's thinking about the boy. One minute we tell him, go, get him, beat him. Next we tell him, no, no, stop. Well, I say go. And may the best man win. Well... Well, I, I agree with you, Mr. Wellman. Oh, no, you don't. All this, 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 this is about too much emphasis on athletics. Wurzelweed. That is, I mean, weasel words. <laughs> Look, 
what is done. We're not cheering our boys on. We're discouraging them. But, Mr. Wellman, I saw a whole flock of boys out running this morning, and they didn't look discouraged. Unless you're speaking of Wally Lovett, and he was only trying to get his second win. Lovett? Ha! And that's another thing, Simmons. You keep a deadhead like Lovett on the team and let Dylan go. Well, I can't do anything about Lovett, Mr. Wellman. I know he's lousy, but I like him. And he likes to run. But what's this about Bruce Dillon? It's a disgrace. That's all a disgrace. Uh, Dr. Hall, I I wouldn't have come to you about Dillon, but Mr. Wellman insisted. Uh, Suggested, Simmons. Suggested. Well, yes. uh, Suggested on an or else basis. (laughs) Uh, You see, Dillon has dropped off the track team, Dr. Hall. Well, that is bad news. Did he give you any reason, Coach? Oh, yes. Yes, and one I never thought I'd live to hear. He feels that he's been wasting precious time, that he came to Ivy to study. (laughs) He's studying all right. He's out to make straight A's or busts. Ha, ha! How do you like that, Dr. Hall? (laughs) If I didn't like the idea of a student trying to make good grades, Mr. Wellman, I'd have to resign my position. I must admit that it's good to hear of a runner who wants to toe the mark scholastically. Well, perhaps the real significance of this has escaped you, Dr. Hall. A, a very fine athlete has been so de-emphasized, he's, he, he's turned into nothing but a student. <laughs> Poor boy, you make him sound utterly depraved. I couldn't say that, Mrs. Hall. Well, you, you implied that, Mr. Wellman, but perhaps we misunderstood you. My compliments, Dr. Hall, for admitting the possibility. <laughs> If I haven't made myself clear, then I don't understand myself. And, and if I don't, why don't I? Uh, because I put the interests of Ivy before myself. And if you and Simmons can't see what's happening right under your... Well, that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, look, Dr. Hall, a coach can push a boy a little now and then, but he's got to know when to stop or he'll just shove him on his face. If Dylan doesn't want to run, I don't want him. No matter how good he is, if he feels that way, he's still no good to me. Maybe not to you, Simmons, but don't stand there and tell me Bruce Dillon isn't good for Ivy. That he isn't the best man we've ever... That, 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 he, that he hasn't a chance. I mean, he, he might even go to the, the Sal Hinky uh, for the Olympic Games. Uh, Sal Hinsky, that is. No, I mean, Hell Hinky. <laughs> well, Mr. Wehrman... Uh, Dylan has made his decision, and I believe that each individual student must determine for himself his reason for being here. This is not a question of de-emphasizing anything. It's, it's simply a matter of placing the emphasis where it properly belongs. Well, I don't belong here, Dr. Hall. Obviously, I'm a minority in this matter, but thank goodness I'm a minority with the majority on my side. <laughs> Goodbye. I must admit there's one thing I admire about Mr. Wellman. He always raises his colors in defeat. Yes, yes. He makes a hasty retreat sound like a rousing victory. Yes. Well, I want to thank you, Coach, for your enlightened attitude. Well, Dr. Hall, I, I want to win, but uh, that's not all I want. Maybe that's why I'm coaching at a small college and loving it. <laughs> well, thank you both for your patience. Bye. Now, goodbye. goodbye, Mr. Simmons. Mm, poor Coach Simmons. The first year he gets a really hot prospect, and look what happens. Bruce Dillon comes down with a case of athlete's brain. (laughs) Well, athlete's brain is a disease unlikely to reach epidemic proportions. Uh, Some students are bound to take scholastic honors, and some are bound to earn marks for strength and agility. But it's a rare thing to find the honor bound and the muscle bound in the same package. lab of Doc Bateman, the head of Ivy's chemistry department the other day. Doc was correcting mid-quarter examination papers, and I interrupted him just as I heard. Oh, no. Well, hello, Doc. Is something wrong? Huh? Oh, it's you, Carpenter. There's nothing wrong. I'm merely exercising your professor's right to groom at the answers I get to my exam questions. Oh? Well, what particular answer had you on the ropes as I came in? Question four, part two of our recent chemistry one exam reads, and I quote... Describe the composition of coal. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. What's wrong with it? Of course, it's a good question. The only thing wrong about it is this answer. And again, I quote, Coal is composed of big chunks and little chunks and coal dust. (laughs) Well, isn't it? Oh, 
Carpenter, everyone except you and my students know that coal is a carboniferous, not a vacation of vegetable Oh, sure, sure, I know, Doc, but who cares? You say who cares to me? Julius Charles Bateman, head of the Ivy Chemistry. Oh, look, Doc, I'll explain. For example, you take Schlitz beer. Beer lovers know that it's brewed from select barley and hops and yeast and other fine ingredients. But what they really care about is how Schlitz beer tastes. And let me tell Just you, Just a minute, Doc. Carpenter. Let me save you the trouble. Slitz beer tastes so good, it's the best-liked beer in America. Is that what you were going to tell me? Well, that's right, Doc. How'd you know? Uh, Carpenter, I've heard you before. <laughs> Don't ask me why I listen. I just do. A man has to have some weaknesses. <laughs> and besides, I, I like Slitz beer myself. Ah, good for you, Doc. Oh, yes. Let's take a ten-minute break and take it big. You know where we can find a couple of bottles of slits nearby? Doc, I just might. Let's be on our way right now. As we return to the halls of Ivy, it's a few days later in the early afternoon, and Dr. Hall is in his study. As a matter of fact, he's in a brown study when his wife, Victoria, enters. Oh, why, sorry. I didn't know you were still here. I thought you'd gone. Mm, a slight delay, Vicky. Oh. Mr. Wellman's secretary called to say that Clarence would be coming over at 2.30 and he didn't want to miss me. I hope you told her that you wouldn't miss him. <laughs> yes, well, the, the retort occurred to me, my dear. But, <laughs> but insults, when necessary, and they almost never are, should be personally delivered, not through secretaries. Oh. Well, with you, dear, bad manners are an effort. What are you looking at? No, nothing. Just an old scrapbook. Well, let me see. Oh, Charlie, look at you in your underwear. Oh, Vicky, that is a tracksuit. Oh. I was somewhat of a dash man, you know. Well, you're still dashing to me, darling. Mm-hmm. But didn't your knees ever get cold? <laughs> well, when one runs the 100-yard dash in approximately 10 seconds flat, one is totally oblivious to the weather. Of course, I use the word approximately loosely. <laughs> The truth is that my best time was ten and two fifth seconds, and that was considered quite good in those days. Mm. Well, what are you doing back in those days at this particular moment? Why the research? I, I was checking on some track records uh, before I started working myself down to a maudlin nostalgia over my undergraduate athletic triumph. <laughs> I was trying to find out when we last defeated Bradford in track. I found out it was a long time ago. Mm. You really did have high hopes of winning this year, didn't you, darling? Well, I... Yes, of course I did, Vicky. Until Bruce Dillon dashed them. Oh, mind you, I have nothing but admiration for that boy. No. How many times do you find a young man who is such a brilliant athlete, well, who can win so many honors, and yet who can make such a courageous decision to give them up? Mm. After all, it's not often that you... you... I wonder... And mind you, I wouldn't confess this to anyone but you, Vicky. No. But I, I wonder, was it, um, was it really necessary for him to, uh, to take such a drastic step? Well, uh, do you think you could maybe talk to him and change his mind? Yes, I could talk to him and, and, and uh, uh, no, no, Vicky, how can I? How could I? As the president of the university, go to a student and suggest that he is overemphasizing his studies. <laughs> yeah, I can see where that might confuse him slightly. Mm. But uh, why couldn't you suggest that uh, perhaps he might more wisely distribute his time and energies? You mean, uh, say, uh, two hours in the library to an hour on the field? Mm, yes. Yes, yes, that, that's not a bad idea, Vicky. Yes. I, I could. No, no, I couldn't. After all, he's crossed his Rubicon, and I can only commend him for it. Mm. Besides, you know, you can be very persuasive, darling, and you wouldn't want to influence him, would you? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> nope, the issue's closed. Yeah. Nothing to do but forget it. No. Of course, this, this was just a moment of weakness, mm. Vicky, you know. Just, just, I, I could only indulge in the privacy of my own home. Yes. Thanks, to, thanks to your no, understanding. It isn't going to be private any longer. <laughs> Almost the first, if not the only virtue you notice in Mr. Wellman is that he's always punctual. Dr. Hall is expecting him in this place. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Hall. 
Oh, hello, Mr. Wellman. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Wellman. You sound tired. Aren't you feeling well? Yes, it's not me that's sick. Dr. Hall, I know there are times when I seem to lose control of myself in my eagerness to serve Ivy. Which everybody knows you do with the greatest of energy and vigor, Mr. Wellman. Yes, and sometimes I may raise my voice and become... Well, you can't change human nature. But, Mr. Wellman, you've changed. I hardly recognize you. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Hall. But it's too late. Well, good heavens, what's happened? Just a matter of a few days before he would have to change his mind, which I never had any doubt of, that he would. Never for one minute did I believe that Bruce Dillon would stick to that ridiculous, that insane, that uh, uh, nonsense of his. And has he changed his mind, Mr. Wellman? He's sick, Dr. Hall. Dillon is in the infirmary. Oh, well, that's a shame. Oh, what's I'm the matter with him? He itches, day and night. <laughs> they examine him thoroughly, and they, they can't find anything. He, he, he just itches. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Wellman, Obviously, I, I it think... It was bound to happen. A nervous breakdown, a fish out of water. A shoemaker should stick to his last. A, a grind to the millstone. His nose. <laughs> Mr. Wellman, I, I you, think... That you were only thinking about academic standards. Simmons wasn't thinking at all, but I was all the time. I was thinking about the boy. But, Mr. Wellman, what is it, Dr. Hall? <laughs> Mr. Wellman, uh, you, you've started me thinking that perhaps your news may turn out to be good news. Good news? Our best crack man in the hospital? You call that good news? Why, why Dr. Hall, of all the inhuman, the heartless, the cold-blooded. Well, Dr. Hall, all I can say is that with what you're thinking, I hope you can sleep tonight. Goodbye. <laughs> Now I recognize him. That was Mr. Wellman. Yes, and he was right. I was thinking about academic standards. It made me realize that now I have to go and speak to Bruce Dillon. Come on, Vicky. Well, it's certainly flattering to have the president and his wife come to see me, but Dr. Hall, I didn't know I was that sick. Fortunately, you're not really sick, Bruce. Dr. Taysom has assured us that your condition is only temporary. And besides, Dr. Hall and I don't limit our sick calls only to those who are an extremist. Uh, has your itching stopped? It comes on me in waves, Mrs. Hall, but I'll try not to scratch while you're here. <laughs> oh, don't mind me. As the old saying goes, scratch where it itches, not where it looks the best. <laughs> That, that will uh, that'll subside, Bruce. <laughs> Not likely to last the legendary seven years. Uh, but you're just upset, emotionally as well as physically. It takes time for your system to become accommodated to such an abrupt change of pace. I guess I did start track too quick. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. You, you might easily have. <laughs> I suppose I'll have to go back out and get some exercise. Good, good. Yeah. A half hour now and then in the gym ought to take care of me, don't you think, Dr. Hall? Uh... In the gym? Uh, yes, yes. Or, oh, well, perhaps half an hour running someplace. Yeah. <laughs> I mustn't give it up too abruptly. Oh, no. Oh, no. no, no, if I did that, I'd end up on the track team again, right back with the same old problem. Oh, dear. Yeah. See, I finally woke up and realized that I've been wasting my time for the past two years. Well, I hadn't heard that you were failing any of your courses, Bruce. Oh, I'm getting by, but at the rate I've been going, I won't win any honors. That's why I decided to knuckle down and quit spending so much time on something that doesn't mean anything. After all, when you go to college... Hey, Bruce, I brought you the books here. Oh, excuse me. Hello, Dr. Hall. Hello, Wally. Hello, Wally. What, no tracksuit? Oh, I just got out of class, Mrs. Hall. Uh, I'm on my way to the lockers now. Well, you don't have to explain to me, Wally, just so I know you haven't thrown in the towel. Oh, no, not me, not now. Wait till you hear what's happened. Coach has put me on the team for the cross-country run against Bradford. Well, that's great, kid. Well, congratulations, Wally. I know you'll do splendidly in the long run. <laughs> in the long run. <laughs> uh, thank you, my boy. <laughs> well, you see, Dr. Hall, the coach figured it this way. If I finish at all, it'll count for a point. Now, the fellas put it another way. They said there's always a happy possibility that one of the Bradford guys will drop dead. 
And there's also the chance that you'd stumble over the body, thereby ruining your own chances. So, so let's hope that your triumph will be over live runners. <laughs> well, I, I might surprise them if I ever get my stride. It's getting a little monotonous coming in last. I hardly know the rest of the team when I meet them face to face. <laughs> Well, there's one consolation, Wally. I've noticed that the last man often gets more applause than the winner. That's the story of my life, Dr. Hall. All the other fellas laugh me. And a half hour later, in comes Wally Rearguard, and they give me a big cheer. And all I want is just one tasty little silver cup. Listen, Wally, I've told you what's wrong. You're pressing too hard. Look who's talking. Who's itching? <laughs> Bruce, you're getting metal bound. Your brains need a rub down. Well, I gotta get out and practice. I'll see you. Bye, Dr. Hall. Bye, Wally. Bye, Wally. Oh, you know, Wally's my roommate, but I sure don't understand him. I don't think he's ever gonna win anything, but he keeps knocking himself out. And for what? Oh, for the reason that people have been playing games since the beginning of time, Bruce. To take part in something. To try to win, yes, but most importantly, to take part in a contest of some kind. And it doesn't matter whether it's a potato race or the picnic or the Olympic Games. I was fortunate enough to attend the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles. Little Japanese girl ran in the hurdle race. At the gun, she was left on her mark. Then she crashed into the first hurdle and took a bad fall. She picked herself up, ran and hit the next hurdle and fell on her face again. She hit every hurdle on the court. But she got up again and again. And she finished with tears streaming down her face. And down the faces of almost 100,000 people in the stands. We all recognized that the courage, which would finish a course strewn with failure, had won a phantom ribbon to wear on her spirit. Oh, you've made your point, Dr. Hall. I guess I'm just dumb. You just proved to me that Wally's got more brains than I have. He isn't overemphasizing overemphasis. <laughs> well, you're, you're not necessarily dumb, Bruce. You, you both make good grades, and you both love to run. The only difference is that while Wally hasn't got his stride yet, he's never lost his balance. And spiked shoes or philosophy, if you keep a sense of proportion, you're running on the right track. The Hall of the starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman, has been presented by Schlitz, the bear that made Milwaukee famous. The taste of Schlitz. The taste so many people prefer has made Schlitz beer first in sales in the USA. Why don't you two enjoy the most popular beer in history? Next time, every time, ask for Schlitz beer. And now, here again are Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Thank you, Ken. Ladies and gentlemen, one of our characters tonight was a boy who ran without any hope of winning. He ran because he liked to run. Most healthy boys do. But last year in America... There were an estimated 28,500 cases of polio. Boys and girls, men and women, who were taken out of the running by this crippling disease. Four out of five of these cases were financed, at least in part, by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, the March of Dimes. But polio is creeping ahead of the available funds. So please make as generous a donation as you can. Yours is the power to line with silver the dark clouds which threaten our children and our neighbors. Thank you. Good night. Good night from all of us. And from our sponsor, the Joseph Smith Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and its thousands of friendly dealers throughout the nation. We'll be seeing you next week at this same time at the Hall of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Colton. Mr. Wellman is played by Herb Butterfield. Also in our cast were Ken Peters, William Tracy, and Victor Perrin. Tonight's script was written by Barbara and Milton Merlin and Don Quinn. The Halls of Ivy is presented by the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who invites you to enjoy on television the Schlitz Playhouse of Stars with the brightest names of Hollywood and Broadway. See your newspaper for Time and Channel. Ken Carpenter speaking. Now, just for laughs, join the Great Gildersleeve on NBC.